Thank you very much, Chair Shaheen, Ranking Member Moran. And let me just say at the top, as we continue full steam ahead in our bipartisan work uh, to return to regular order for the first time in many years and pass funding bills in a responsible, timely way, these hearings are really an important opportunity for us to assess what we need to keep our country competitive on the world stage and to keep folks back home safe and sound. And they are also a, an important reminder that defense is just one part of the equation. If we maintain our competitive edge, we have to stay at the forefront of scientific discovery. And NASA and the Na National Science Foundation both have long storied histories of helping our country do that. After all, the list of times that our nation has made its mark on history, the list of ways that it has established itself as a world leader is much more than a list of military achievements. It is a story of inquiry, invention, innovation, exploration, and discovery of new frontiers. You know, our country has seen time and again how those investments really pay off. They do strengthen our defense. They strengthen our economy. They strengthen our global leadership. You know, innovation and inquiry, I don't have to tell either of you, isn't just an abstract ideal. It, it makes our lives better. It makes our nation safer in really tangible ways. Cleaner energy faster, more sustainable manufacturing methods, better understanding of new technology like artificial intelligence, or preparing us for rare but serious risks like asteroids or solar flares. And those investments also keep America competitive in ways that are harder to measure but are very important that we don't overlook. You know, the moon landing didn't just affirm our leadership in space and science. It inspired a new generation of kids to study STEM as uh, Bill Nelson has told me many times. And it helps, helps us push the bounds of what is possible. So, you know, just look at the latest photos from the um, James Webb Telescope. It is lighting the imagination of our kids right now. And so at the end of the day, these investments that we make in this Appropriations Committee really is an investment in our country's future. So I'm really glad that you're holding this hearing and look forward to working with both of you to have a strong bill, um, bipartisan bill at the end of the day. With that, um, Director Punch, uh, you know, well, short on specifics, House Republicans have been calling uh, for cuts to non-defense discretionary programs to fiscal year 2022 levels, taking us back there. Can you talk specifically about how that would in fact, or impact uh, NSF programs, including basic research and STEM workforce development, if Congress were to go back to those levels? Thank you, Senator Murray, and uh, thank you for your comments. I really appreciate uh, what you said, because this is a moment, it's a very, very important moment in our nation's history, because this is a moment, as I said, of intense global competition, and therefore we cannot take any steps back. We have to move forward. Global competition is severe, and it is serious, and it is real. So if we were to go back to uh, FY22 levels, it will really be, uh, you know, you know, it will have tremendous amount of impacts. You talked about AI in your remarks. I can tell you the AI institutes that we are launching will have to cut back on AI institutes. We'll have to cut, cut back on the quantum investments that we are making. We are going to make the quantum, a new quantum investment to take the ideas from the work that is happening from basic research into translational outcomes. That would not be possible. This is called the National Quantum Virtual Laboratory. Would not be able to move forward with that. In terms of regional innovation engine program that we just launched, there has been tremendous interest all across our nation in terms of presenting the basic innovation ideas that are going to be possible from everywhere. And so these regional innovation engines are going to make possible the jobs of the future and new industries of the future, new entrepreneurial ventures of the future. We would have to cut back on the regional innovation engines program, and that would not be a good outcome because we have essentially raised the excitement of the entire nation feeling like we are ready now, we are ready to play a role in lifting up this nation and contributing to it as well as benefiting from it to the jobs of the future and the industries of the future. So uh, I, I hope that we will be able to continue the progress and leap forward rather than taking any steps back. And uh, I look forward to the support of Congress on this one. Yeah, thank you. And can you comment specifically on how that level of funding would impact NSF's ability to deliver on the ambitions of the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act? So it will have a tremendous uh, ramification. Let me give you one, another, one, another example which might probably be useful. Now, the nation needs to train 280,000 new workers in semiconductors and microelectronics over the next five years to keep pace with the rest of the world. So a reduction 
would preclude NSF from being able to reach an estimated 10,000 individuals in FY24. And this really threatens our long-term US competitiveness in semiconductors and other key technologies. I'm just pointing one example from the workforce. I talked about the examples in AI, quantum, biotechnology. We will not be able to launch on the bio foundries that I think we need to have all, many parts of our nation to be able to spur more innovative activities and therefore more jobs. And the, the basic research work, there is so much that are ready to be translated. We don't want to miss the moment of translating this and giving this away to our competitors to build on those translational activities and build the industries of the future. The industries of the future belong in our nation. The jobs belong here. And I think we should do everything to make sure that we do not slow or impede our progress. Thank you very much for that. Um, Administrator Nelson, uh, Washington State, as you know, has seen an incredible growth of space-related companies and suppliers and researchers and innovators. And those companies have really been able to capitalize on the talented workforce graduating from our universities and use the infrastructure in place to become a hub for space ex exploration technology. How do you see NASA expanding and partnering with companies and universities in the Pacific Northwest? The big difference in our space program is we <clears throat> go back to the moon now uh, from half century ago is we go back not only in a public-private partnership, but also in an international partnership. Thus, for example, the first crew going to the moon, three Americans and one Canadian. Uh, in this case, when we land on the moon, NASA will go into a lunar orbit, a brand new kind of orbit that we are characterizing right now with a spacecraft in that orbit, the crew will transfer into a SpaceX lander and eventually another lander as a result of the second competition which is going on at this point. We want to have two landers. Uh, that is illustrative of the public-private partnership that we have going on, but it is throughout the entire agency. It's in low Earth orbit, for example. When we shut down the space shuttle, uh, you all helped Kay Bailey Hutchinson and me pass the NASA bill of 2010. That set us on this course of the dual track, a government track, but also a commercial track. And look what's come out of it. We now regularly deliver astronauts, NASA astronauts, to the International Space Station and cargo with private corporations. Now, because it's human life involved, uh, we are all over that, double checking, uh, triple checking, everything. But it is illustrative of this new public-private partnership as we go into the future that is quite different from the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman.